Hey everyone, it's Mark from Flight Sim School, and today we're going to be continuing our look at all of the little details that you're going to want to know about when you're flying the A2A Comanche around. And we're going to be looking at how to start the engine, how to manage heat during the climb out, as well as how to configure the airplane for best power or best economy at cruise. Like I said in part one, the simulation in this plane is second to none, and that means it also needs to be taken care of properly to keep it working right, so let's start looking at all of that now. The Comanche comes with integrated checklists that you can get through the EFB if you go onto the flight info page and then into the checklist subpage. You'll have a checklist for pretty much every phase of flight here. But learning the steps to starting it up manually is pretty simple and after a while it really becomes just muscle memory. And the first thing that I actually do is go to the controls page and take off the wheel chocks, the tie downs, the control locks and the pitot cover. I'll make sure that the parking brake is still set because we don't want to accidentally roll away on engine start. And next after that, I'm going to set up my nav radios or the GPS depending on what I'm doing by first turning the master switch to on and then turning the avionics to on as well. We're doing a VFR flight today from Oban to just a little bit further north of Inverness and we can follow the lakes north for that. We don't really need a route, but I'm setting it up anyways so I can show you how the autopilot works a little bit later in the flight. I won't cover the details of how to do all of that setup in the GPS since it's a bit beyond the scope of this video, especially since there are three different GPS options for the Comanche. But if you need help with that, there are already other great GNS 530 videos out there that can help you out. With that set, I can turn the avionics back to off and then we can turn the beacon on. And from here, we have to go between the two seats to turn both of the tanks to on. Although you could also decide to only turn on one tank at a time and just swap which one you're using throughout the flight. There are pros and cons to both approaches. Turning them both on now means that you don't have to remember to switch it during the flight. And if you do forget about it, like I often do, then you end up with an uneven weight and balance across the tanks, which isn't great. On the other hand, if you go with only one tank on at a time, you get a little bit more control as to where you're burning fuel and it protects you from accidentally running one of the tanks down to empty without realizing it. But for the most part, the fuel burn seems to be pretty equal when you have them both on, so I don't think it's a very big risk. Alright, let's get the engine started. So the mixture needs to go to full rich. The prop needs to be all the way in as well. And I can crack the throttle open just a notch. And this is actually the number one problem that I've run into as to why the engine won't start. I often forget to just open the throttle a little bit and it makes all the difference. It's kind of hard to tell with the reflection of the sun on the instrument panel, but the carb heat is off. And now we need to turn the fuel pump on just to make sure that the pressure comes all the way up into the green and it should only take a couple of seconds to start moving. And once we see that it can do that properly, we can turn it back to off. On an average day, you'll probably have to give the engine five shots of primer, but if it's colder out, you'll likely need to use something more like seven to ten shots, and you don't need to worry too much about flooding it. From what I've seen, it's very hard to flood this type of engine, and I haven't run into all that much trouble with it either. Next, we can set the mags to both. And we'll press the engine start button to start cranking the engine and we can hear it trying to turn over already. If it didn't catch after about 10 seconds, I would press the starter button again to just stop trying to start it. And I would prime it once or twice more and then just try again with the starter. But in general, in ideal situations, it's going to start pretty easily. Now that the engine's running, I'm going to set the throttle so that it maintains around 1000 RPM because any lower than that and the engine's going to start sputtering and eventually turn off. And I'll also lean the engine just a little bit while I'm sitting on the ground just to avoid spark plug fouling. Although if you took my recommendation from the previous video, which was to use the fine wire spark plugs, none of this should really be an issue. We can turn the avionics back on now so they can initialize themselves. 
And while that's going on, I'm going to bring back up the EFB. And one of the neatest things about it on the flight info page, it gives you everything that you need to fly out of any airfield in flight sim, especially when there's no METAR available where you're flying out of. And I'm going to start by setting our barometer to the right value. Although oftentimes I'm just going to press the B key, but you can obviously set it yourself by just twisting the little knob next to the altimeter. I'm also going to press the D key to adjust the HSI for gyro drift and I'm going to go into more detail about why and when to do that once we're in the air. For now I just want to reset it and we'll do it properly later on in the video. All right, with all of that done, we're just about ready for taxi. And I want to remind you while we are taxiing to the runway to like the video if you've learned something useful already and subscribe as well so you don't miss out on the last part of this Comanche deep dive. Your support is really what helps the channel the most. So please take just one second to do that. All right, we're lined up on the runway and the last two checks to be done before takeoff are that the elevator trim is set to the neutral position. And I'll also check that the rudder trim is centered as well, since I often forget to reset these after the previous flight that I did with the airplane. And it can definitely cause you trouble either at rotation or even just veering off the runway if you've got too much rudder trim. There's no need for flaps for takeoff in the Comanche, so at this point I've just got to bring my mixture back to full rich, turn the parking brake to off, and we can get going. Unless you've loaded the plane to its max takeoff weight, it should get up the speed pretty quickly, with your rotation speed being at around 85. And that's one thing that's a little bit deceiving about the airspeed indicator because it's in miles per hour rather than knots. Your speed in knots is shown on the inside of the airspeed indicator if you really need it, but the easiest way to remember it if you want to do some quick math is that miles per hour are just over 10% faster than your same airspeed in knots. The gear should come up as soon as you're out of runway, and if there's some kind of obstacle that you need to clear, you can pitch the plane to use the best angle climb speed. Otherwise, I tend to use a speed that's just above the best rate climb, and I'll adjust my pitch to hold around 120 knots because it gives me better visibility. That'll give you about a 1200 foot per minute climb rate on an average day, but when it's warmer out, it might be a little bit less than that because the engine's significantly affected by outside air temps. Once you've settled into the climb though, you have to watch out for heat, especially if you're flying on a warm day. You can quickly end up with overheating cylinder heads and you can monitor the bar graphs on the engine monitor, which represent each one of the cylinders of the engine. And if any of them exceed their limit, the cylinder in question is going to turn red and you'll get a red flashing CHT message right below the bar graphs. One thing I do to stay ahead of it is to reduce the engine RPM just a little bit to start to around 2400 RPM, which will also help to keep the prop from spitting against its limiter as well. And then from there, I just keep monitoring the bar graphs. Cylinder number three is the highest right now, but it's still got a little bit of room before it overheats, so I don't think we'll run into any issues. But if you do end up in a situation where you're over temp, Scott from A2A made a couple of recommendations on how to handle this in one of his videos. And you can start by reducing your climb rate, which is going to have the effect of increasing your speed and pushing more air into the engine to help cool it. In very hot situations though, I found that isn't enough and you'll have to bring the prop back down a little bit more, maybe all the way to 2100 RPM at least until the temperatures drop and settle down. And if that still isn't enough, you can also bring the throttle back to reduce your manifold pressure until the temperatures start to drop as you continue to climb, at which point you'll be able to bring some of that power back in. Now as we continue to climb, we're going to run into another problem and this time it's the loss of engine power as we keep going up, which is normal for a combustion engine, but there is something we can do to help it and that's to adjust the fuel to air mixture. If we have a look at the engine analyzer on the EFB, you can see that the intake pipes have slowly been turning from an orangish color to a more blackish orange color the further up that we climb. 
That means that our mixture is getting too rich with fuel relative to the amount of air that it's getting, and it's going to continue to get richer the higher we go. So we're going to lose more and more power as we keep going. That's also reflected on our engine horsepower, which is down to 71% right now. So what we can do to fix the problem is to start pulling the mixture lever out a little bit. And you're going to see the color coding of the engine analyzer is going to go from that dark orange to a much brighter orange, which tells us that our mixture is now set just right to get the max power from the engine. You can also see that as I've done that, the engine horsepower has gone up too, and it's now up to 76%. So that's almost a 5% improvement, which is going to go a long way to help getting us to our cruise altitude faster. I'll usually only adjust the mixture once during the climb out to bring it back to the more orangish color, but that's obviously going to depend on how high we're thinking of cruising at. So let's look at those options next. In general, you're going to want to be between 4,000 and 8,000 feet since that's the altitude where you'll still get good performance out of the engine. And you can go higher up to say 10,000 to 11,000 if you really want to. But you have to remember that this plane isn't pressurized. So anything higher than that is a little bit tricky. What you can do is check the flight info page on the EFB and watch what the wind does as you continue to climb about every thousand feet or so. And you're looking for where you're either going to have the highest tailwind or the lowest headwind so that you can get a higher ground speed and get to your destination just that little bit faster. Distance is the other thing that you can keep in mind, but if you're flying a long flight and you want to get the best fuel economy possible, a higher altitude in the 8000s to 10,000 range might be worth it if you can get especially favorable winds, but otherwise I'll just stick to the normal 4000 to 8000 foot range. There are a lot of different ways that you can go about choosing your cruise configuration, but I find the easiest is to use the power setting table that's on page 17 of the guide that comes with the Comanche, and you can find a link to that document inside the community folder for the airplane where it's installed. The table is split into three different power output columns, and I pretty much always use the middle set of values, which should give us about 65% of the engine's power at any given altitude and setting. And I find it to be the best compromise between airspeed, engine component life, and fuel economy. Lower RPMs, though, are what really keeps your engine components happy over the long term, so I'm going to use the 2200 RPM column for the most part. And if we cross check that with our cruise altitude of 6,500 feet for today, that means that I should be setting my throttle to 21.8 inches on manifold pressure. Let's set that up now. So to start, I'm going to bring the RPM back to 2200, which is right about there. And then I can pull the throttle out until the manifold pressure reads 21.8 but you don't have to get either of these numbers perfect on the digital display. So long as you're near the number, it's gonna be fine because the exact setting is gonna vary based on a couple of different variables anyways, notably the outside air temperature. The last thing to do is to set the mixture to get either the best power or the best economy from the engine. And as we saw earlier during the climb, we need to turn our intakes orange to get the best power. And they're kind of dark orange again right now. So I'm going to pull the mixture out again until they become that brighter orange color. The advantage of the orange best power setting is that it's going to give you just a little bit extra airspeed at the cost of some fuel. Whereas the best economy option is going to conserve more fuel with a slightly lower airspeed. Our best power mixture setting, which we're configured for now, is giving us 61% of our horsepower and 14 gallons per hour of fuel consumption, which matches up pretty closely to what the power setting table told us we'd get. And this is pretty much the configuration that I use most of the time at cruise because I'm not too worried about fuel consumption. Let's keep pulling the mixture out now and see if we can find our best economy config and to compare what we get with that. And as I'm doing it, you can see that the intakes on the analyzer are turning green. And once they've become pretty much all green, it means that we found our best economy config setting. 
In terms of fuel consumption, that's a tad under 11 gallons per hour. So we're saving about three gallons per hour versus our best power setting. And in terms of airspeed, we're not that much slower. We're at maybe five knots. So overall, if you want to travel a long way or you're low on fuel for whatever reason, you can always set yourself up in the best economy config to just get to your destination just a little bit slower, but to save on gas. There are a few other ways to set your mixture from using the lean fine mode on the engine monitor to just doing it by ear and listening to the engine, but using the power setting table with the engine analyzer really takes all of the guesswork out and it makes it super simple to set up. We've got a few more topics to cover from a navigation point of view, like how to adjust for gyro drift, how to use the autopilot, and a few other things. But that's going to be in part three, where we're going to wrap all of this up and come into land. So make sure that you like the video on your way out and subscribe so that you don't miss out on the next one.